Welcome everyone. I am Mahanur Yusuf and I graduated from Harvard Business School in 2016 with the PLDA. I'm also co-chairing Harvard in Tech Seattle chapter. Harvard in Tech is the official Harvard University-wide alumni group for technology. We hope to further the development of technology through encouraging innovation, providing resources and network and promoting technological activity throughout the Harvard community. Today's webinar is getting recorded and will be available at the Harvard in Tech Seattle webpage. I'm here with Roger Hackett, my fellow alum, to moderate a panel discussion about smart city, the future of the economy. Hackett, I'm a HES 2018 alum, and I'm the president of Ryan and Robbie LLC, where we develop, um, we develop part smart play systems, and we also um, still do publishing for both books and software. We are so honored to have six distinguished panelists joining today. Uh, Dr. Alex Pentland is a professor at MIT. He directs MIT Connection Science and MIT wide initiative and previously helped create and direct the MIT Media Lab. He is one of the most cited computational scientists in the world, co led the World Economic Forum discussion in Davos, and led to the EU Privacy Regulation, General Data Protection Regulation was central in forging the transparency and accountability mechanism in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And Forbes declared him one of the seven most powerful data scientists in the world. He is a member of advisory board for the UN Secretary General and UN Foundation, and formerly the American Bar Association, Google, at and and Nissan. He is a serial entrepreneur who has co-founded and more than a dozen companies and is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering and leader within the World Economic Forum. His most re recent books are Building the New Economy, Trusted Data, Social Physics, and Honest Signals. Dr. Pantelin is joining us from Boston. Thank you very much. Next, Dr. Yana Ramas is an economist and a partner at the McKinsey Global Institute, MGI. McKinsey and Company's business and economics research arm. Dr. Ramas leads MGI's urban world research series that includes sizing the impact of smart city solutions on citizens' quality of life, mapping of economic power of cities, identifying global consumer groups shaping global demand, and mapping of the global company landscape, as well as the pat patterns of urban growth across the Americas. Dr. Ramas has a PhD in Applied Economics from Stanford University and an MSc degree in Economics and Philosophy from the University of Helsinki, Finland. Dr. Ramos is joining us from Davis, California. Everyone, thank you so much for inviting me to join. Our next panelist, Dr. Christian Bott, is the Chief Innovation Officer of Data and Analytics at Cisco Systems. To accelerate Cisco's transformation towards a data-driven, digitally-enabled maker of software and subscription services, Dr. Bott cross-functionally drives the development of new capabilities, the adoption of revenue and productivity-enhancing applications of advanced analytics and artificial intelligence. As part Part of this role, Dr. Vaught partners with world-class startups and venture capital firms in and beyond Silicon Valley, innovating outside in on high-impact opportunities across Cisco. Dr. Vaught has a PhD in engineering from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, one of the Germany's designated elite universities, and an MBA from Wharton School of Business. He has published numerous books, articles, academic papers, and patents. Dr. Vaught is joining us from San Francisco Bay Area. Good to be here. Thanks for the invite. Thank you, Dr. Vaught. Um, Next, Peter Jackson is a portfolio director at IDEO San Francisco, where he is focused on the intersection of consumer experience and organizational design. His experience at IDEO has enabled him to work across both the public and private sector to transform service delivery through digital, retail, and multi-channel experience. 
Peter also leads work with government agencies to improve the, the citizens' experience. He has helped craft and implement new strategies for delivering public services in job training and community development, economic development, and public benefits across state, local, and federal government. Peter is joining us from San Francisco, California. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to the discussion. Dale Kalinger is a former section chief at FBI, a recipient of Purple Heart. Dale participated in Army Reserves Officers Training Corps and was commissioned as a military intelligence officer serving in the National Guard and Army Reserves. During his tenure at FBI, Dale investigated all manners of crime. He is a certified FBI hostage negotiator and worked for several years, primarily in the exploitations of bulk data to assist in countering terrorism. Later, as a senior executive, he was charged with building the FBI's insider trade program from the ground up, utilizing his expertise in the operational application of bulk data to build the best insider trade program in the U.S. Dale's expertise led senior executives to represent the FBI with the White House and other government and non-government agencies. After retiring from the FBI, Dale has been an independent consultant to Fortune 100 companies, assessing enterprise-wide employee risk and insider trade programs, as well as designing implementation roadmaps for success. Dale holds a uh, certification as an insider trade program manager and an insider trade vulnerability assessor from Carnegie Mellon University. Dale is joining us from Alexandria, Virginia. Thanks for having me. Okay. Our next panel is Shihar Lau. Um, Shihar is a co-founder and CEO of Elixir Technology, a progressive and leading tools and platform provider of next generation smart solutions. Under Shihar's dynamic leadership, Elixir has empowered many enterprises across industries, both local and international, with business intelligence and analytics solutions, including big data analytics and visualization, video analytics, IoT analytics, among others. Shihar is currently the chairman for the Smart Nation chapter and a counselor in Edutech, Singapore's premier association of technology companies. He is also a recipient of SCS fellowship, an honor conferred upon individuals with significant contributions to the IT industry in Singapore. Shihar is joining us from Singapore. Good to be here. Thank you, Shir. Thank you all for joining us. We are so honored to have you here. Today's panel discussion is about smart city, the future of the economy. We will explore smart city technology solutions, socioeconomic impact, human-centered design, social sustainability, data privacy, safety, ethics, and more. Motivated by a vision, Smart infrastructure, system, and services, many cities and communities view advances in networking and information technology as a way to increase efficiency, reduce costs, and improve quality of life for their residents. They seek to become smart cities and smart communities by embedding new digital technologies into their infrastructure systems and services to enhance existing and develop new city resources. Smart city solutions are intended to enable new capabilities and opportunities all in the face of limited budgets. The possible applications are numerous. Citizen services, smart grids, intelligent transportation systems, remote healthcare, and more. Although informational technology promises enormous public benefit, it also introduces new challenges. These challenges range from technical to ethical, legal and social, including cybersecurity, data sharing and analysis, privacy, public health and well-being, workforce and education needs, and cultural and socioeconomic considerations. Addressing these challenges require new forms of cross-sector and cross-government collaboration, experimentation, knowledge sharing, and alignment. While there is enormous potential to leverage data-driven innovation to improve the quality of the life in urban environment, the United States will need to take actions if it does not want to fall far too behind in the race to build smart cities. 
So we will move on uh, to our discussion with our panelists. We will start with Dr. Pantelin. Your new book, Building the New Economy, coming out soon, where you discuss smart city technologies. Can you share your vision and framework for how we manage the complexity of the data and technology solutions for all stakeholders? So, thank you. Um, so, uh, first of all, the book is on uh, works in progress at MIT Press. It's just on the web. You can look at it. Um, the, the key thing here is, is that we're in a situation, particularly now, where some of these things that have been slow to develop, like smart cities, need to be done very quickly. And, and the reason is, is that we put ourselves in a really odd financial position here. Um, we have all these inequalities that are sort of coming to be visible in healthcare, in income, and things like that. And we have to do something about it. And the thing that we have to do, of course, should be something that not just saves money, uh, but is actually helps all sorts of human-centered values, and ideally is something that produces return on investment. Uh, it's very hard to make arguments about smart cities when all you're doing is playing around the edges. <clears throat> and it's one of the reasons it hasn't really taken off in the United States. It's like, why? You know, we'll do that next year. So um, if you put on the sort of first slide, uh, I was trying to do it this way. So um, what you can do is you can do investment in real productive assets. So this is how Singapore built those beautiful uh, towers behind Mr. Lau. This is how China built up so quickly. Um, essentially what you're doing is uh, using free money to build this debt driven economy. Now that often results in problems, um, but today we have enormous data resources. So for instance, we have something on the web, it's inequality.media.mit.edu, which covers virtually all of the metro areas in the United States. It shows inequality spending patterns uh, for every store in the metro areas in America. And we can update this every week and it's not hard. And and uh, you should look at it, it's interesting. And what it shows for us is, is that mobility in our cities inhibits income growth. It is a major factor, in fact, the dominant factor in segregation. It is the major factor in many of the things that we worry about because we haven't been able to see these sorts of things. And so the data is there, the question is about privacy and control. So what we've been able to do with data, and I'll get to that in just a second, um, what um, we've been able to do with data like this is demonstrate new uh, verified ways of growing the economy of specific neighborhoods. We can actually predict the success of stores before they're built by looking at the patterns of mobility around them. It's really pretty amazing. It, it, it reduces the risk by about half in these sorts of investments. And there's all sorts of interesting tools now for community ownership of these investment tools. So we we're just talking with uh, Mr. Lau, Dr. Lau about how Singapore is deploying these things. We've done this, uh, these tools for Swisscom for investments in Switzerland. We've done it for Intuit, your taxes are done this way. Uh, fidelity, you, when you move money around, it's using uh, our architectures uh, and we're beginning to work with Signal. We help Singapore with fraud today. So if you go to the next slide, uh, explain a little bit about how we can actually make this work as a practical political thing. And you know, it's clear that ownership of this data is something that is dangerous if it's broadly held or if it's held in few hands, like. Google or Facebook, but uh, in our legal framework, uh, collectives, co-ops for citizens, not to own their data, but to help them use their data. And it's exactly that data that we've been able to use to show that you can get remarkably good investment opportunities by the community for the community. And so what we're doing, if you click one more time here, 
is we're working with a number of the large co-op organizations in the world, credit unions. So these people are actually legally empowered today to, to help manage their, and what we've been able to show is with that access to that sort of data, you can begin uh, rearranging mobility, rearranging public investment to cause specific neighborhoods to increase wages, to increase uh, overall GDP, uh, to have much greater access to opportunity. And I think that's the thing that will end up driving uh, smart cities, is the fact that we have to bring this sort of uh, opportunity to neighborhoods that have been left behind and that we need to take advantage of this investment opportunity because in this high inflation, low interest rate environment, all of the traditional ways of making money just won't work. So let me just stop there. Great. That was, that was, uh, that was very, there's was very informative and uh, I really enjoyed hearing that information. I want to have a, expand the conversation. Um, yeah, I want to expand the conversation to, uh, to, to Dr. Ramos. Uh, how does building a smart city impact economic growth locally and also globally? I really want to hear more about that, the global picture. And how have different policies contrib contributed to industry competitiveness and growth? I think that's a, the, a $50 million question. Everybody wants smart cities because they think that's going to create great tech jobs. And um, I'm sorry, so, so sorry that I'm going to disappoint. When we took a pretty in-depth look globally at the leading cities on the smart city space, and we took a look where we actually looked at, okay, what has smart cities done? Uh, and what they could do based on the best evidence. And we looked at it from the perspective of how, we'd, how it could change the local environment, the quality of life of the people, starting with the economic variables like cost of living and jobs, but also looking at things that matter a great deal for the quality of life, such as time spent. So how much time do you spend queuing or in commute? Safety and security, how safe you are in your city, how healthy you are, how well you're taking care of that, how environmentally sustainable you are. And we also looked at social connectivity. So we kind of took a broad look. And across the board, smart city technologies can make a huge difference for the quality of life. We, we found 10 to 30% improvements in areas that we all care about. Like for example, good public transit information, early detection of any issues that might make a train stop on the tracks so that you can prepare it before it actually breaks down or kind of good information about where the traffic jams are and capacity to divert traffic through traffic lights, for example. All of those things can make a big difference and save all of us something like 15% of our commute time every day, which when you do that in most cities, that means two full days over a year of additional time that you didn't waste in traffic. So the impact is very large. The only area where that disappointed was in jobs and cost of living. We really saw very marginal impact. And the reason is that a lot of the technology that goes into smart cities is not necessarily local. It's basically, it's a physical infrastructure that typically you buy it from global companies because of the scale makes a big difference for the cost. It's the software layer on top, which really can't be, again, global. You don't, you basically, and most of the things that have become very broadly applicable. I mean, the most broadly distributed applications are, of course, something like um, on-demand uh, drivers, Ubers and Lyfts um, around the globe and other similar ones. So they, they don't really create jobs locally as much. They, what they do is some of the installation side, uh, but also in some cases they do reduce employment, for example, in the public sector, because you need fewer people, fewer repairmen, fewer people actually going and checking, for example, electricity metering, et cetera. So it, it actually is a mixed impact. So I'm sorry to say, Roger, I don't think there is a great uh, economic impact story. I think it is a story more of the fact that as cities think of how they are going to grow, we are all competing for the, the bright minds, the creative, innovative folks. Cities that work are cities that attract that kind of folk and smart technologies are the ones that can make it easier. Uh, in, in many, many different ways. And I think for, that's the way, right way to think about smart cities. It is a tool, the newest, the most cost-effective, in many ways, the most uh, today's 
tool in the toolkit for making cities work for its citizens. And that really is what a thriving city is all about. So I think it's less about we need to make a city smart. It's more about this is the city we want to be. And here are the bits and pieces of smart city solutions that will help me get there. That's the way I would think about it. Smartness itself has very little value to me yeah. unless it makes my life better. Can you speak to uh, the policies that might make it better or worse in different in different parts of the world? Are, are there things that, that the governments can do that that might shift it one way versus the other? I was actually listening when Alex, you were talking about the, the when, when we look at the smart city solutions, one of the biggest constraints here is that technology typically gets costs down very quickly when you get to scale. And the challenge with cities is that they are very small and very fragmented. There are we say that there is, we have about 3,000 cities with uh, 150 to 200,000 population or more globally. That's 3,000 different customers, but they are very, very fragmented and their political um, cycle is very short. So you have, it is a very hard market for anybody to sell and get to scale very quickly. It is a slow process and it is, it's the nature of the beast why it is hard. So I think it's less of a specific policy. It is the incapacity to coordinate. So if we had a way, for example, of uh, scaling up in some way, and I think in some cases, if you go directly to consumers, you can do that. If you have, for example, some of the suppliers who are already the utility players in a big area, they can provide the same service as same uh, smart city solution as a service to all of the cities in their area. For me, it's less about the specific policy than it is about, uh, about the capacity to get to scale. There are exceptions though. And here, so for example, energy efficiency and environmental quality, those are things where regulation matters a great deal. Guess which city in the US has the highest percentage of smart uh, thermostats? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, it's Austin, where they actually have a requirement that any house that has air conditioning needs to have a smart meter so that you actually ch ch uh, save energy. So regulation that forces you to be smart obviously makes the city smarter. So I think there's things like that that make a difference. Um, uh, if I can say a last point on this one, which is, I think, again, referring to what you said, Alex, on this time being different. Health is actually an area where we are seeing dramatic change in smart solutions right now. This is the, this is the moment for smart cities to become healthy cities. And I think that's something, that's a space to watch because we are seeing a lot of investments um, on making sure we don't make people unnecessarily go to the hospital, have them do more at home. So I think that's the, that's the space. And I can talk more about that if people Great. have appetites. I'd like to kind of uh, open this question up to Dale. And Dale, I want to I hear a little bit more about these, these cities in terms of security, in terms of we talked about health, we talked about uh, segregation being a, a, a tip, a potentially an issue. So, so if, if it is indeed a situation where, where these cities are fragmented and we don't have uh, equal economic activity, are, are there ways for us to make sure that there aren't bad actors entering uh, either to steal data or to um, offer services that aren't, aren't legal, things like that? Well, I, think, I think the real challenge is, <clears throat> is around the standards, right? So legal framework standards and technical standards. So GDPR helps in Europe. Uh, but here in the U.S., not so much, right? We have 50 states, 50 different sets of rules. Uh, what, what are the technology companies to do to meet those fragmented needs, right? From a security perspective, uh, from a, a, certainly the data privacy perspective. That's that trade-off, that challenge that we have. Uh, we saw TikTok in the news, right, where they've been, they took MAC addresses uh, in, a, in a way that was uh, outside the standards. Uh, that they were supposed to be doing. So where where are the where's the public protected? If you have a smart thermostat in your home, great. Uh, but where's that data go, and who has access to it? And what are the legal standards by which you can hold someone accountable? Um, the government is held accountable, and I spent a good part of my career as the government gathering data and trying to be um, trying to exploit that data to find terrorists. So I have a good handle on what the government can do and what the restrictions are on the government. Yay, there are restrictions. Uh, not as much on the private side, right? What can Google do with your data? Uh, what can Amazon do with your data? That, that, that's much harder. So when you get to smart city and you start talking smart devices and internet of things, you know, where are, where's that data aggregated? How's it exploited? And what, what as a consumer, you as a consumer, 
where can we control who has access and what they do with it. And that's all the way down to the algorithm level, right? So now you have a gunshot detector that has an algorithm. Great, you know, we're all, we're all happy that there's an algorithm on a device that can detect a gunshot. Uh, but what about the algorithm in your house um, that, that, you know, predicts something else for you? Um, Netflix, what movie you have, great. Uh, but are they discriminatory, right? Because I'm of certain class, does it affect me differently than someone of another, another class? So there's many, many hard problems to think through on the privacy and ethics side that then we need the technologists to implement in a transparent way so that we're all protected. Excellent conversation and great insight, Dr. Ramos, that smart city can contribute to 10 to 30% improvement in quality of life. Thank you, Dr. Ramos and Dale. Uh, let's move on. Next question is for Dr. Bard. Smart cities are driven by sensor data, algorithms, and policy. What are the do's and don'ts of designing smart cities for efficiency and effectiveness for all stakeholders while protecting the public? Thank you, Mainur. Um, so I'm in data and analytics now, and I have some experience with digitization um, in the broader sense in the corporate world as well. Um, and smart cities remind me of digitization in the corporate world in many ways. Right? So what is digitization? Digitization is the application of high tech to a company's processes to make the company better at what it does, right? And can be automating and increasing productivity, can be to increase customer engagement in NPS, um, can be to improve quality of the products, and in some cases even offer an improved value proposition. A city is like a corporate in many ways. It has customers, right? Those are the people who live there and work there or travel there. Um, it offers services to these customers, like transportation, like security, like the fire department, and it has employees, right? People who uh, work in one of these services or in city administration. So it has a CEO, that's the mayor, it has revenue, that's the tax revenue, it says. So that is very similar. Right? And if digitization in the corporate world is the application of technology to a company to make the company better at what it does, then making a city smart is, again, the application of technology to a city to make a city better at what it does. Um, so, you know, and, but the similarities go way beyond just the definition. It goes way beyond the what. It also relates to the how. You know, and that, that is what this question is about. They also relate to the do's and don'ts of making a city smart. And there's a number of best practices in the corporate world as it relates to corporate digitization that apply to smart cities as well, right? And I would like to highlight three of those. The first similarity is that becoming a smart city is a journey and not an event, right? Um, just like an enterprise doesn't become digital overnight, but over the course of many, many initiatives, you know, some are successful, some may not be that successful. A city too, you know, it's a spectrum, right? It's, it's not, doesn't become like just smart overnight. Um, so arguably, arguably, you know, there may not even be an end to this journey because new technologies and new possibilities keep coming up, right? So when is the city smart? I don't know. Um, so rather than looking at individual initiatives to figure out if a city is smart or not, it is a lot more meaningful to look at what a city does, you know, the capabilities. How does it identify and prioritize new initiatives? What does it learn from these initiatives, from the successes and, and the failures? Right? Um, how does it ensure that its customers and employees are on board of what it does, right? How does it make sure it gains the trust from the people who live there. So that's one key parallel to the corporate world. The second similarity is that you have to pick your initiatives in a needs-driven way, not in a technology-driven way. It is something that I see so often. You know, instead of asking, where can I put my sensors? What data may I collect? You know, should we build this roadside infrastructure to let cars communicate? It's, you, you know, figure out what are the key pain points in a city, right? And then, then figure out if technology can actually help address those challenges. So you, you talk to your employees, you talk to the customers of the city about what their biggest challenges are. Maybe that is congestion, right? Maybe that is crime. Maybe the administrative processes are just taking way too long. And then you figure out 
to what extent technology can help surmount these challenges. And in doing so, of course, you consider all potential options, including the ones that are less digital and perhaps less exciting. So if, for example, if traffic congestion is a problem and your highways are full of potholes, then your best bet may not be a fancy traffic sensor, but simply filling the potholes first. Right? It can be a really boring solution as well. Um, so that should, that should be the approach. Um, technology more like as a, you know, like not technology forward, but needs driven. And the third similarity I want to point out is the importance of the very first initiative. Right? The first initiative plays a special role for, for three reasons. First, it gives the company as well as the city confidence that it can do these kind of things. Right? That's number one. Second, it demonstrates that there's real value to be captured. It demonstrates that you can solve the challenge better than it has been done before. And the third, perhaps the most important one, is that it builds trust with the people who live in the city. And this is so important because even more than in the corporate world, in the city space, you will be collecting a lot of data and privacy, the protection of that data, um, and everything we've heard before, is so important. Privacy is an important issue, right? And you need these first initiatives to build this trust. So for all three reasons, you need to be clear on what you want to accomplish, then make sure that you measure this, and you make sure that you communicate these numbers in a way that people understand. These things need to be very data-driven, right? And combined with a portion of really good storytelling with that data. So the first initiatives that should thereby, therefore be you know, selected very carefully. It matters less how much value create for that first initiative. What matters a lot more is that it works. Right? The first initiative has to work to convince people and to build that trust. And, and for this first initiative, you, know, you have only one shot. So start small, know that this is a journey. Start with the need and work backwards, not with the technology and work forward. Right? And pick your first initiative very carefully, prioritizing feasibility over potential. That will be my take. Thank you, Dr. Vogt. Um, anyone else would like to uh, um, contribute? Any comments? I would quickly say that I would quickly say on the privacy side, you know, having better functionality for the user to opt in and opt out some anonymization, uh, whether it's blockchain or some kind of technology that allows for that, but also on the law enforcement side. So when law enforcement does have to access data, uh, that there's good protections in place, but, but that we can access data when we need to. Uh, you know, child molester, you know, that kind of stuff, we all want to solve those crimes. Uh, but if you encrypt it to the point where no one can get to it, that's a challenge as well. But in the smart city side, right, you know, you're talking traffic devices, cars communicating, all of those things, that all needs to be properly protected. So, so one of the things that's a, a fundamental move for smart cities is not to use individual level data. So in the projects that we do in different countries, we produce something we call uh, rich census data. So it's neighborhood by neighborhood data, uh, but it doesn't show individual uh, 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 behaviors. And we use that for behavior to be able to look at inequalities of various sorts, as well as transportation, as well as financial uh, difficulties. Uh, by And by uh, keeping things at that level of anonymity and aggregation, which people are familiar with, so you can explain this to people that it's like census data, uh, you cut through an awful lot of problems. And in fact, you can do quite a bit in terms of uh, understanding where there's likely to be problems going forward. The second thing though, is this business of who owns the data and who's looking out for you. Data is complicated, it's like money, and you need some sort of an institution that helps you. I mean, I know a lot about it, I work in this area. I wish I had a staff of experts that would help me figure out what to do with my data. And uh, with my money, I give it to Fidelity or I give it to a bank, which is an audited uh, fiduciary that is responsible to me, not to the people that are using it, in order to help me take care of my resource. And I think it's one of the things that we're lacking in uh, virtually every society at the moment, uh, but uh, hopefully something that we can begin to, to stand up. 
the legal frameworks there. It's just we haven't gotten around to it. Fullheartedly agree. And the one thing I would add is that transparency, to your point, Dale, as well, is obviously key. And that transparency of what you're going to do with the data needs to be use case based. You know, it's not a thing that is just, you know, it's just based on the data. It's a use case based thing. So like you get the opt in from people, you get the buy in from people for a particular use case. The fact that you have collected a certain set of data doesn't mean now you can do everything with it that you want, you know. Um, before you even collect it, you need to be clear on what is the use case going to be. Um, and if with that same data, something else can be later done as well, then you need to get an opt-in again, right? And you again, like need to treat it as a very separate use case. So one thing that's sort of helpful in all of this thing is, is that uh, GDPR is finally biting in America because of the ruling that if you process European data at all, you have to be certified to be GDPR compliant. And then you have CPP in California, which is pretty much the same thing. And, you know, if you're not operating in California, what are you doing? And, and so, so you see this sort of thing where for anybody that's a big player, they're just going to have to do this because they want to be worldwide. They want to be nationwide. And as you develop standard systems to do that, then lots of other people will begin adopting these standard systems. Uh, and uh, you know the ball begins moving in the correct direction. Great. I think yeah, this. I just, I just would like to uh, um, respond to uh, <laughs> Dr. Vogt's point about the importance of having the first uh, initiative test of the right use case. And in fact, uh, in Singapore's case, uh, there was big fanfare about our prime minister launching the Smart Nation in initiative. That's about uh, six years ago now. And so everybody's just waiting to see what's going to come out of it. And in fact, the first set of app, uh, uh, solutions that was offered is actually, um, it's all under the tagline moments of life. And so it's really about, you know, having your first kid, uh, getting your house, you're getting married, uh, fouling taxes, and eventually even there's a full registry, you know, so you know where your will can be, can be deposited. And uh, yes, we had the other sensors and big data, but they, those actually were not given that the high uh, um, publicity right at the beginning. And, and, and as you pointed out, that, that really got the buy-in from a lot of people. So in fact, it's the, the opposite happened, like in a recent case, due, due to COVID situation. So there's all these contact tracing applications. Yeah, they use Bluetooth to try to connect, to, to, to track who has been with, whoever infected for how long and but that got a pushback uh well it's useful but actually it, you know as what most of you have mentioned uh the, the the fear or the concern about data protection actually came in uh so i think that is definitely the, the fundamental trust i think uh that is the key uh, success effect i have to agree with jaina though that the first things that you're going to see in the u.s are health because we have these obvious health disparities, education, we're just getting there, but boy, is that gonna be a nightmare. And you need to have neighborhood by neighborhood data so that you can craft neighborhood by neighborhood policies. Uh, and uh, you know, so those things will begin to push cities in the direction of sort of real time, aggregated neighborhood by neighborhood data for a number of uh, sort of living quality of life type things. Great. I think this is a, a perfect segue for the next question that we have. And I, I want to just say before we start this question that we've heard a couple of things here today. We've heard that data can be very powerful. The algorithms can be very powerful. The government's policies and the laws that are put into place can be very powerful. And then uh, um, Dr. Void also uh, mentioned that uh, there are the actual use cases that are that we want to consider when we're thinking about what we actually do from a, a, a user perspective. Um, so I want to I want to talk a little bit more about how we balance these two things, these these the thing that the thing of the data and the algorithms and the thing of the, the actual user needs. And so I'm going to I'm going to look to Peter Jackson, but but also open it up to the panel as well uh, with this question. The power of, of smart cities is phenomenal that we were clear on. And it's driven by the aggregation of data. Now, to what level? I think that we hear there's a difference and in, in it, it makes a difference how, how much aggregation we have in terms of privacy and other things. 
Um, and also that there's automation of these services that, that can be powerful. Can you walk us through a little bit of how the human-centered design uh, that IDEO uses can balance the social benefits with social costs when it comes to privacy, safety, and ethics? Yeah, absolutely, Roger. I really appreciate the question. Um, just to like take a quick step back for a second, like as we think about like what we mean by smart city, as we think about that question from a human-centered design lens, um, it's just one of a different kind of what we would call an intelligent system, something that's able to sense, something that's able to act, and then something that's able to learn upon it. So we were talking about thermostats like nests in Austin a few minutes ago. Um, if you think of like the dumb thermostat that um, most of us had growing up, um, right? That can sense and it can act, but it can't actually learn. It can tell, okay, this is the ambient temperature. It's uh, below the uh, temperature that we've set for the heat to come on. I'm gonna send a signal to the furnace. It's gonna fire up the furnace. It'll heat up the room. Um, where Nest comes into play is it's actually learning through that process, um, through human interaction and feedback by adjusting that dial up and down, the presence of a person in a room or not, and it actually can make better decisions over time about how to keep your home comfortable. So as we think about kind of that framework in terms of smart cities, um, you know, maybe a great example here is around um, navigation um, and directions, either through transit or through in your car. Um, by actually using an intelligent system like Google Maps for me to navigate from my home in Berkeley to our studio in downtown San Francisco. Um, at the end of that journey, Google's actually learning about the route that I took and whether or not it's meeting up with its expectations of how long it's gonna take for me to get from point A to point B. Um, but that example gets to one principle of human-centered design and around this idea of data science and intelligent systems that we think is fundamental, which is um, there's this uh, sort of prevailing perception that like data is truth because it's quantitative, um, that it uh, is infallible. But in actuality, humans decide what data to collect, how to store that data, um, how to then display that data back to users. And so a great example of this is um, a study actually done uh, in London that looked at the performance of um, existing taxi drivers versus rideshare operators um, and found that just because you give somebody um, who's a perfectly competent driver an intelligent system to help them navigate the city doesn't actually make them um, a faster driver. It was actually taxi drivers with intimate knowledge of the city who are able um, to better get their passengers from point A um, to point B. Um, and so I think that idea as we think about the design of smart cities that like how, who, what data are we choosing to collect, how are we choosing to store it, and then how are we choosing to present it to users in the system is fundamental for balancing those concerns of privacy um, and ethics. And I'll just round out with one other principle that's been really valuable to us in doing this work, which is also about not presuming the desirability of intelligent systems. Um, you know, uh, one classic example of this came a few years ago, uh, the app Strava, um, which I use to track my runs and my bike rides around the Bay Area. Um, but so were a bunch of U.S. military personnel um, based in uh, uh, what were supposed to be uh, secret military installations in the Middle East. Um, and because of um, their use of Strava to um, track their runs and their exercise activities, it was actually possible um, for um, people to be able to discover that they were actually running around the perimeter of a, a military installation. And so while from a user's perspective, highly desirable, from a societal perspective, this idea that we're collecting data, making it available publicly, um, without considering what the consequences of that aggregation might be, um, ultimately that's not a desirable uh, situation for the US military and I argue really for society generally. Um, and so I just, I'd actually go to some things that Dr. Vogt said earlier that really resonated with me. One is this idea of starting small, um, right? Not going for scale right out of the gate, but actually um, making the prototype as small and as simple as possible. Um, and second, don't start with the technology, start with people. Um, design uh, and uh, prototype with the users in a city um, at the outset. And if you start from a human-centered perspective as opposed to a technology-centered perspective, you're more likely to um, land on something that balances those needs of privacy, desirability, um, and trust. Okay, I would like to ask you just to expand a little bit on one point that you made when it sure. comes to the, the data that is presented to the user. 
Uh, can you speak a little bit more about how do you know how much data to provide to the user? And then also, uh, you know, to, in terms of giving them the information actually needed at the right time versus um, uh, overwhelming them with data. Yeah, I, I really wish I had like a flashy answer on this one. Um, I mean, the kind of principle of design thinking and the work that my firm IDEO has done for what, like the last four decades says that the way that you answer that question is um, that um, you prototype the solution as quickly and cheaply as possible. Um, and you do so directly with the people who are going to um, be using uh, that data. So, um, you know, one example of this is work that we did for uh, a hospital system. It was around reducing the incidence of um, medical errors. Um, uh, we had uh, uh, hospital administrators collecting um, data and inputting it around, uh, you know, where doctors have made mistakes in surgeries and then um, trying to figure out, okay, how do they then put in place policies and procedures that help to reduce the incidence of those kinds of mistakes going forward. And it starts with things like paper-based prototypes of, okay, what if this was um, the screen that was put in front of you and the recommendation that was given to you? And I mean, literally handing the Sharpie across the table, uh, a little bit more difficult in our uh, COVID-enabled remote workforce, um, but the idea of like asking designers or, or asking your users to co-design with you um, and to really explain what it is that they're seeing through their eyes. And then from there, going to another layer of resolution and saying, okay, well, we'll make like a quick click through prototype. Um, but basically the idea is, is like, take the riskiest question, which is in the, in the case of uh, this hospital work that we did, um, that someone's gonna misidentify um, like a very deadly mistake that a hospital might be able to, to make and figure out how to turn that um, problem into a question that a user can help show you, this is how I might be able um, to solve that. Um, and do that as quickly and, and cheaply as possible. Invest in that user experience first and understanding what they're gonna do before moving to building a giant technology platform, um, to building a, you know, a expensive algorithm to, to optimize for data. Okay, I think we need to move to the next question, but I, I do want to hear Dr. Pentland's point of view uh, to the same question if we have time later. We will move on to the next question. Uh, this is for Shihar Lao. Uh, what made Singapore a successful pioneer of the smart city? Public sector transformation is an important part of a smart city. Can you speak to key technologies and issues you have experienced in transforming the public sector? Well, as many speakers mentioned, technology is not to be the first thing to think about. Uh, but I think uh, putting that aside, certainly uh, technology has an important role to play. Uh, I, in fact, I would say that's what something quite different from uh, Singapore's uh, journey so far is instead of, I've seen many smart city blueprints, of First thing we do, they would do is well, here are all these different applications, all kinds of uh, latest and greatest stuff. Uh, instead, I think in Singapore, the first thing was that came out of it was actually how do we build the foundation for a smart nation. Uh, so, in fact, I was sharing earlier with Dr. Pentlin that uh, the Singapore guy just announced uh, the initiative to build a government OS and operating system. So that actually they have defined. Uh, a stack, a technology stack. So it includes uh, how to do microservices, uh, how the middle West and talk to each other. And uh, you know, in fact, this is, um, as what was talking about the more media is what will make it smart uh, is really where they can communicate, you can talk to each other, right? And same thing, I think there's a danger that if you start doing okay, let's proliferate to many of these applications. And at the end of the day, are they gonna talk to each other? So I think uh, that would be, I would say, an approach that uh, that Singapore has taken. Uh, it's not new. In fact, uh, in, even in terms of um, uh, way back 20 years ago, uh, there's already a data hub. We talk about big data now. So in fact, 20 years ago, the, uh, the government really set up uh, a data hub for uh, people, the people data there, and they, for businesses and uh, as well as uh, for the land, because it's something that they want to manage that. And so a lot of applications don't have to collect all this data over again. So like today, if you ever have any government form, you could just log in with, a, we call it a sync pass. So it's like a one password, 
one account for all of your government applications. And they have actually made that so straightforward that even the banks now adopt the same uh, mechanism. So it, it really cuts down all these form fillings, all these uh, duplicate data that, that generate a lot of problems downstream. So, and, uh, so this, I would say the, the approach really, really made a difference in what I've seen here. So, yeah. You've had a lot of pushback about the fact that you now have a centralized database, which is opaque as to its uses. And you've had some security breaches because it's centralized. And you can compare that to, for instance, Estonia, which made the choice not to centralize its data, but to allow a question and answering system. So it's single, still single sign-on, but the fact that it's not hackable by traditional ways has meant that they, for instance, have uh, withstood Russian attacks and things like that. Man, yeah. thing about it. Don't centralize data. Inaccountable <laughs> <laughs> for what you do with the data, right? Because yeah. we're just entering it. Uh, uh, we haven't seen anything in terms of cyber attacks yet. These are projected to go up by a factor of 10 or more in the next few years because of all the IoT devices. They're all points of attack. And if your data is in one place, uh, you're going to lose. So you need to set up a different sort of architecture where data is not centralized. It's kept localized where it's, where it's collected. Uh, and you have query mechanisms, sort of uniform query mechanisms, so that you can have a history of who's doing what uh, that is as transparent as it needs to be. But more importantly, you can tell when there's an attack going on instantly. Mm. Yeah, so in fact, to, to that point, uh, I, I think you were spot on. Uh, now, first of all, I think the, the, the government here have uh, recognized their risk. So they did something pretty drastic uh, about two years ago, is that they decided they're going to cut off their network from the rest of the world. So the whole of government is on a separate network, and the poor officers have to carry two notebooks, right? One to connect yep. to the government network, another for whatever else they want to do. It created a lot of inconveniences, but um, that was a brute force way to at least provide that that moat, right, from from any but external there is a attack. But of course, which has proven to be extremely robust, uh, and, mm -hmm. and citizens trust it more. Singapore is an unusual situation in terms of the level of trust that citizens have over the government. You couldn't do you couldn't do it in sidewalk <laughs> and you definitely couldn't do it in Boston. <laughs> or, yeah, it seems like a great segue for our next question. Since we're already halfway there, <laughs> let's go ahead and move to, to this question. How can we uh, this is for this is for Dr. Hentland, how can we achieve greater oversight and accountability of legal algorithms while harvesting their potential to provide greater efficiency, ease of access and fairness? It sounds like distributive is a middle ground. A distributive system is a middle ground. Can well, you speak to that a little bit more? We've built systems like this for, for several countries and a number of cities also. And, and the key things are sort of two principles. You don't concentrate data. You leave data where people agreed that the data could be collected. And then you have APIs to the data where there's a very clear use uh, statement of what you can ask and who's doing the asking. And that sort of transparency about data use and this notion of data localization where it was collected for the purposes it was collected it is a great combination because it results in um, really real huge sort of reductions in cyber attack, huge uh, greater transparency about what's being done. We call it open algorithms because you can actually see um, the, the legal agreements that say, this person will use this data for that purpose. And here's the questions that they asked in the past. Uh, I mean, just to give you an example that I find striking, I was in Estonia, which has this. And I was with their CTO of the country in a restaurant. And he said, let me show you my medical record. And I right there in the restaurant, he opened up his laptop, showed me his medical record, and you could see every single person who had ever uh, accessed his medical record and why. And if there was anything that you didn't like, you could file a complaint by single click. And in the years since they put that system in place, there have been zero cases of misuse of data. 
because it's wow. just so hard. You can't steal things anymore. <laughs> Obvious. Who's, who did it and why? Right? Okay. Can uh, Dr. Voigt, do you want to do you want to speak to this uh, at all? And Dr. Rama? Yes. Um. And actually, one one thing you you just said resonated really well, which is the APIs that you would put on top of the data to make sure that you know the right people access the data for the right purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, this is some. Thing has come up a couple of times now it's not just you know you have the data and then anyone can use it for for any use case no you know the data was collected for a specific use case and that was the use case that you got the buy-in for you know this is why people gave you the data and that is exactly what the api will provide right on one hand of course it makes sure that the person accessing the data is you know like has permission uh, ha yeah. has permission to do that you know that is the one thing but it also makes sure that it the data is being used for the right use case exactly good yeah thank you this is for peter um with a lot of real time data sets there are profound dynamics could you speak to how you design services and spaces to handle dynamic changes in the city, such as natural disaster or a peaceful protest, to optimize a smart city both for everyday activities and more extraordinary events? Also looking at research, data can be used to predict innovation, patents, and also disease. How does your re research inform the design factors and smart cities transform to make a city function optimally? We, who decides what outcomes a city prefers? Uh, just a, a place to start um, uh, to make it really tangible. Um, there's some work we actually did here in the city of San Francisco um, around this, this question of data and natural disasters. Um, and again, I mean, this, uh, you know, this is kind of, um, my shtick as a human-centered designer, but it really all comes down to human behavior and the, the way people act um, and behave, which is often unexpected how we might um, expect them to. You'd think that in a city like San Francisco, which has a history of major earthquakes, um, that uh, every resident here would take seriously the need to um, follow the guidance, which is that you, know, you should have the supplies on hand um, at a moment's notice to be able to survive 72 hours um, without emergency city services. Um, and um, the truth is that there, uh, for some work we did for the Department of Emergency Management here in the city, um, uh, as many as a third of San Francisco residents um, did not have um, access to, you know, um, clean water, um, snacks, um, and other uh, nutritious uh, meals to be able to get them through those first three days if we were to have another one of the um, big quakes. Um, and so we prototyped around this question of like, how could we use data um, and create a platform that would enable people to really understand okay, what was happening in the, um, over the course of an emergency. Um, built a uh, really an amazing platform called SF72. It was open source. There are now cities all around the country that are using it as their emergency preparedness um, platform. Um, but the fundamental learning out of doing all of that work was that less important than like access to smart city technology was actually um, enabling people to make connections around their um, uh, their neighbors, uh, you know, within just a few blocks. Um, so it wasn't. This was another example of where the solution that people needed in order to prepare for a natural disaster was not a technology enabled or data enabled service. It was actually a human enabled service, which was the ability to know that oh, my neighbor just down the hall. Um, actually is an ad packer and they keep 10 days worth of um, freeze-dried food supplies um, on hand. And so a lot in that question that you asked, um, but the emphasis I would put on here is what are the actual human dynamics at play and how are people going to interact? Um, there's a lot of benefit that the city got out of building SF72. It came in real um, useful as COVID descended upon uh, the Bay Area um, and people were trying to understand what city services were open and closed and what were deemed essential and which ones weren't. Um, but ultimately, I think as we're all learning kind of in this moment of crisis is that um, all the best data in the world um, can't um, substitute for the um, power of human connection to be able to help us to get through um, a disaster, whether it lasts for 72 hours or in the case of COVID, uh, uh, at least 72 days, um, perhaps even more than a year, we'll be kind of living under these conditions.
Great discussion. We are ready to wrap up now. On behalf of Harvard Impact Seattle, Roger and I thank you for your time today. Our panelists, Dr. Pantelin, Dr. Ramas, Dr. Vaught, Peter, Dale, and Shihar, thank you. It is a great pleasure to have you as our uh, panelists. It was an informative session and we have learned a lot. To the participants, thank you for joining us today. It is remarkable how significantly all of our lives have changed over the past months. We hope you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy during COVID-19. We, we are grateful for the connection and strength of the Harvard alumni community. Thanks to your generosity and support. Hope this webinar will bring in some thought-provoking discussion. If you are interested in learning more, please join us at Harvard in Tech Seattle. Thank you and goodbye for now.